My name is David Chipperfield. I'm the principal of David Chipperfield Architects and uh, responsible, I suppose, for the work of my collaborators and, and partners. I'm being asked to discuss and explain the project that my Berlin office did in the restoration of the Mies van der National Gallery. The gallery is important, the museum is important, I think, in two ways. One, in the history of architecture, of course, it's profoundly important, and it's important within his career as being one of the great icons of his life, and actually it was his last building. But it's also important in the history of Berlin. That's where this intersection is, is fascinating and, in a way, riddled with history, the history of Mies, the history of modern architecture, and the history of Berlin itself. Mies left Berlin before the war, obviously a huge part of his career happened uh, in the States, but he was invited back by Berlin, by the mayor, to build the Museum of Modern Art. I mean, it was an extraordinary commission, direct commission. He was even allowed to choose his own site. The citizens of Berlin were not... Um, citizens of West Berlin were not over convinced, I would say, um, by the project. In the intervening years, I think it's interesting how fond the city became of it. I would say it's not a building that's easy to like in a sort of popular way. I mean, us architects are completely, um, you know, weak at the knees uh, about it. You know, it's been called a petrol station, it's been insulted in all sorts of ways, and <clears throat> in the sense that I would say that um, while it was a very avant-garde building, uh, it became subsumed in a general attitude towards modernism itself. It also wasn't um, without its criticism in, museo in museological terms. Building a large glass hall in which to put art is not possibly the most sensible place to start if you're thinking of uh, collections. Mies uh, was aware of this and, and was challenged to it, and his response was that the idea was so fascinating that he felt obliged to pursue it. You know, the building is two parts, the temple and sitting on a sockle. And effectively, the museum is in the Sokol. It's a, it's a duck paddling very hard under the water, and all the hard work is downstairs in a rather mundane, very straightforward series of exhibition spaces which open onto a very nice garden. The temple, in a way, is the great gesture, and uh, I think the great risk, because museologically, what do you do with it? We're often asked, why would we do a project like this? There was nothing in it for us, a sort of a heroic repair job. I think there's a number of responses to that. First of all, I'm not sure I would do it to any building, but clearly restoring Mises' building was, uh, had a certain honor and responsibility to it. More philosophically, I would say that um, although I and my partners and my practice are committed modernist architects and be believe in architecture, although I'm very convinced we have to slightly rethink um, our professional trajectory or our, our priorities as professionals. But the, I, there, there is a process of collaboration in projects like this. And what I mean by that is that architectural operation of any sort requires an enormous group of people. You need clients to pay for it, you need authorities to approve it, you need contractors to build it. Um, you should need citizens to be engaged in that process as well, although I think we've been very lax in finding convincing methods of participation, but I think it's something that um, our profession has to focus on going forward. As an architect, you find yourself promoting uh, your product your vision, and invariably yourself through that. 
um, and it often becomes sort of exhausting because you you're you're trying to find ideas and you're trying to make those ideas relevant to others but it tends to be um, y you're tending to having to push uh, something which doesn't yet exist and you're having to persuade people about how good it might be and I don't know why but for some reason people don't trust architects there was one phenomenal challenge that was the impossibly poor performance of this glass box uh, in thermal and environmental terms. And so the building for the last 40, 50 years has been accumulating condensation inside. It's been rusting, it's been expanding, and it's been challenging the inside environment. One of our big visible tasks was do we protect the future climate of the building or do we c protect the heritage of Mises architecture which unfortunately comes down to millimeters it's not an architecture where you can tuck a little bit of insulation you know when we did the uh, when we rebuilt the noise museum we could find spaces I mean although we didn't you know we we, we treated it like a Pompeian ruin, we, there are moments where you can look for. There's not much space in, you know, you can't fit a credit card in between Mises' details. And therefore, if we had really um, corrected his technical mistake, we would have destroyed the building. The, the window mullions, instead of being that big, would have been this big, would have been unrecognizable. We had to f cut our way through that moral, philosophical, intellectual jungle and lead people through that. And I think that was an incredibly difficult task. Our insistence to hold on to a ruin was continuously challenged, technically, philosophically, all sorts of things. However, we're really talking about ideas. And so under that umbrella, you can, you can really roll your sleeves up and see these discussions. There is space for meaning. What do these mullions mean if we modify them that way? What does the original paint, which was our insistence to keep, mean? What does it mean to keep 35,000 pieces of the building as opposed to just replacing them? We could have easily uh, replaced all of the pieces. Why not throw the old ones away and get the new ones? We insisted that every piece of stone was lifted uh, carefully, the broken one should be repaired and everything should be put back. Um, that's a completely understandable attitude for a 19th century, 18th century building because it's, it's accepted that that material has meaning. But quite difficult to explain that material from, uh, from a much more recent period and material which is much more contemporary uh, ha carries any meaning with it. Why would the original piece of steel mean anything more than another piece which would be identical? It was a fascinating uh, discussion and an important discussion uh, and brings us, you know, I think, uh, into uh, why such, such projects are, are fascinating. If the climate around that project has the patience um, to deal with it. And as I say, I think we've been extremely fortunate to be in the center of a sort of um, PhD, <laughs> um, you know, paper on the meaning of uh, fabric, the, the importance of, of uh, memory, uh, and to what degree uh, does restoration and replacement um, uh, you know, uh, to what degree does the holding on of, of uh, the idea of the building, is that represented just by the way it looks or the way it, it, it's made? So, you know, these are all fascinating. We've tended to see ourselves as sort of heroic vanguard, creating new ideas and changing the world. Um, 
And I'm not sure the rest of society is really asking us to do that all the time. Are there some themes in this? Yes. Is there a theme of, shouldn't we take care of our past a bit more? Yes, I mean, shouldn't we repair things instead of replacing things? Shouldn't we make sure we don't lose the value and, you know, misunderstand the, the value of things? Yes. This could be interpreted in other ways. It could be interpreted as saying, you know, isn't it valid for an architect to suppress their ego for a while and polish somebody else's? Yeah, why not?